Hey, I'm Steve Guttenberg, and I'm here with my, one of my heroes, or one of my big heroes, Nelson Pass, in his home in Sea Ranch, California. And this morning, just before I set out to do this, this interview, I put up a thing on Facebook, and I asked the, the viewers, readers out there, to give me questions. So some of these questions are from them, and the first one is from a guy whose name is, I think it's a guy, Dallas Dingle. Sounds like a familiar name. Uh, and he said, or he or she said, pretty sure it's a guy, um, the El Pipo subwoofer. Yes, El Pipo. Yeah. Um, well, you can read all about it on the First Watt website under articles. It's El Pipo. It was one of those projects, like many others, which are uh, done because you could. Yeah. <laughs> I, I ran across... Um, uh, it, it, it was one of the resellers of you know parts and stuff. They're numerous. I, I'm not sure. I think they are still in business. That would be MCM. And they had some 21-inch woofers. They were either I think they were clones of the 21-inch Focal, which mm. is a, 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 a famous French, yeah. famous line of product. Yeah. Uh, and and they were relatively inexpensive. So I bought four of them. And, and then it became a, que a question of what to do. And I had also, though, some uh, uh, concrete construction piping. This is the kind of huge cardboard tubes that they use to cast concrete columns with. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they, are, uh, they were 16 feet, and I had a nice 12-foot ceiling in the sound room. So I cut them down uh, to a smaller size and built a little box that they mounted on top of and mounted the twin 21 inch woofers on each side. So I had four woofers into two almost 12 foot columns. And these were uh, what we think of as uh, quarter wave uh, resonant pipes in the same sense that you would do the, uh, for a pipe organ. And- um, Wait, wait, were they vertical or horizontal? They were vertical. Okay. You could run them horizontal, but yeah. the, the idea is that I had the space vertically. And uh, they were pretty fantastic. <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> and of course, people would go, what the hell is that? And, uh, but if they listened to them, they, they quickly figured out that there was, in fact, a, a, uh, some method to the madness. The first time they were played, I, I lived up on a hill. And down at the bottom of the hill, we had a pond. And my daughter was down at the pond playing with the frogs and the, and the fish and stuff. And she came running up the hill because she'd heard this, you know, uh, almost like Jurassic Park <laughs> kind of yeah. sound coming down. And, and uh, you know, El Pipo, it had a resonant frequency. It, it, it actually peaked at about 15 hertz. Wow. And so whatever, you, you know, and of course it was just a subwoofer. We used it to augment the Klein horns, which also is an article at First Watt, which were uh, some backloaded horns that were, uh, they too were, uh, I think they were probably about 16 feet long horns. They were folded. Thanks. Yeah. I guess. They went up like a giant Klein bottle, which is partly why they were called Klein horns. And the other joke was Klein means little in German. So it was the, <laughs> it was a double joke because they were huge. And they were powered by a six and a half inch louder and yet produced pretty plausible bass. Wow. So between all of this, though, we had a pretty spectacular system and we ran it for a long time. I mean, it was a really, it was really, it was one of those, a lot of fun things. In the end, I had to give them away because I had other projects to go and they took up the, I had a 30 by 30 foot room uh -huh. with 12 foot ceilings and, and, with those in there, I couldn't do anything else. Yeah. And so uh, ultimately they were given to an artist collective in, 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 down in the Bay Area. Oh, and, well, that's good. kind of disappeared. But uh, the Kleinhorns have recently resurfaced uh, as an art project that somebody did and were, I had it on display in Vancouver and I guess it's, it's traveling around. But nice. you know, big, huge wooden horns. Uh, a little bit like the, uh, the, there's a Japanese design called the Dionysio. I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. Who, and he did something that looked kind of like that. Uh, it was a bit smaller. <laughs> but great project. 
So the next question came, comes from Herb Reichert, who was out here uh, about a year and a half ago or so yeah. from Stereophile. And this is a very Herb question. He said, if you play a recording on a hundred different systems, how would you recognize the most accurate one? I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they would obviously all sound different. Right. You know, and, and I have no access to the original venue or, right. you know, or I suppose I could put on a pair of very fine headphones and try to think of that as the reference and then imagine mm. uh, how close any of them were. But like so many other people, I just go with whichever one makes me happiest to listen to. Yeah, I'm in that camp. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand the accurate because I think even the people who made the recording uh, wouldn't really know it when they heard it. I, I think that's right. And, and I just kind of subscribe to the, uh, the, uh, the, the modern notion of literary criticism in which, you know, you, you can't really judge a work based on whatever it is you think you know about the author or what he was intending. Uh -huh. and, the, and the notion that we should be experiencing exactly what the artist intended is, is kind of problematic because I'm not aware that the artist has that much control over what it is that finally happens. Yeah. You know, you know I, I, was just, I just thought of something that it's like uh, com composers, classical composers, are not usually the best to conduct their own music, right? Now, you'd think they wrote it. They knew it was in their head. Who would know more about what the music should sound like than the composer? But most composers can't conduct. Well, and it seems to me that uh, most musicians are not particularly the most ardent audiophiles either. Wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I'm, I'm an audiophile, but I would also be categorized as a frustrated musician, so. <laughs> I, think, I, I think a lot of audiophiles are. I, I certainly am. I was married to a musician a long time ago, and uh, I tried to play many different instruments, all of them very poorly, so. Uh. Yeah, I played drums. Oh, well, they're not. But I know what drums But they're not musicians. Like. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. What do, you, what do you call a drummer? I mean, uh, what do you call, I messed up my own joke. What do you call a guy who likes to hang out with musicians? The drummer? A drummer. <laughs> I like that joke. <laughs> this question comes from Michael Bovard. I'm sort of mangling your name, Michael. I'm sorry. I think I remember that name from Oh, okay. Yeah. And he was asking about the change of the sound of the past labs 0.5 to 0.8 amplifiers. Yes. That uh, what, basically, why? Why did you change? And what what was the result? What was the result in the change? Well, you know, of course, in commerce, the, the shark has to move forward at some point <laughs> or other. Okay. And uh, the X amplifiers now date back to 1995, which makes them what uh, 24 Four years, years old. old. Yeah. So the first generation on of those, uh, which were just the, no point um, on the model was um, they lasted a little over 10 years. And, and then we felt that they were getting a little long in the tooth. At some point, everybody who's going to buy one has bought one maybe. <laughs> okay. you know, and, you and you do slowly start seeing sales declines if you're watching for that. Right. But also, you know, we, we like to be creative. We like to do a lot of stuff. And we like to upgrade the product. And there are people with suggestions or not. But we, we, we inevitably move forward. So. Some 10 years or so after that, um, the point fives were developed and there were, some, there were some wrinkles in that design that were improvements and, and, uh, over the original uh, X series. And it, uh, it, was, it was very successful. And, and we, we, we do a very simple, uh, we do a very uh, a smooth sort of segue with new product. In other words, we don't announce the new models and the old ones are dead. In fact, typically, we continue to produce both the older and the newer huh. for a year or two. Uh -huh. I, I'll give you an example. We are still producing point fives for some customers. And it's wow. three, four years later. Huh. So, um, but the... Point fives also, you know, another 10 years or so goes by, the, again, it gets, it gets to be time to have some sort of a change. Uh, in the case of the point eights, we made numerous alterations. Uh, we made the power supplies bigger. We made the output stages bigger. Uh, we made the heat sinks and the chassis bigger. And we were able to crank up the bias more so that the, the, the degree of class A-edness uh, became a, a little higher. Uh, we also did, uh, well, a couple other things that were important. Uh, one was that um, 
we went from what's known as a VFA, a voltage feedback amplifier topology, uh, to uh, a CFA, current feedback topology, which is a misnamed topology, but it's what they call it for mm -hmm. not good reasons. And uh, we picked up some improvements there sonically. The other thing is, is that we had been working for quite a long time with the SITs over at the little first watt uh, sandbox that, that we mm -hmm. have. And um, had, had to be basically discovered that if you, um, if you play with the spectra uh, of the distortion figures, and this is not by way of actually offering more distortion or necessarily uh, you know, giving up any performance from, a numeric, from the ordinary numerical standpoint. But if you play with the, uh, the distribution of harmonics in the distortion that remains in a product, you can alter the perception of sound. And the SITs were real good at that because the, the first one that we came out with had a knob and you could actually play with that. You could dial up second harmonic in a negative phase character or a positive phase character and there was a spot in between where you could null the second harmonic out altogether and uh, this is one of the one of the uh, charms of the static induction transistor that, that that you can do that sort of thing and we quickly found out what people preferred and lo and behold we found that uh, uh, Jean Hiraga who uh, is, is credited with some of these observations uh, was probably right in that um, of the distortion that you do have, and I'm not advocating high distortion, you, uh, if you have dominant second followed by a lesser quantity of third and then the other higher order harmonics drop off rapidly, you get a sound that tends to be most pleasing to the listener. Now that said, uh, the X series at normal, X the 0.5s for example, at like ordinary listening levels, they were still in the zero, zero X distortion number kind of realm. In so other you, words, weren't, were, you weren't doing a first watt thing, you weren't adding second harmonic. We were, well, it was already in the circuit. It was a question of whether in, in creating balanced supersymmetric circuits, we were suppressing it. Okay. Well, we stopped, we stopped working so hard to suppress it and we let it fall in line with the odd order harmonics. And not only that, but we saw to it that it had the uh, negative phase character on that second because we found that that was, uh, that was an important element. If you have, and, and this is a common perception, I can't say that everybody experiences the same thing, but a negative phase second harmonic tends to uh, give an apparent expansion to the sound field so that things move out a little deeper and farther. Mm -hmm. If you go positive phase, it kind of moves in and becomes a little more intimate, maybe a little more detailed. It's totally an illusion, but there it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also found though that most of the customer base liked the negative phase. So we I basically just set it up that way. And it, it meant altering the topology slightly so that the amplifier was inherently had a small amount of asymmetry and um, and sent it out and initially there were people who loved it and there were some people who didn't like it as much as the point fives uh, although I thought you know they were in a minority but I was very pleased to see that in many cases uh, they they kind of turned around <laughs> after a couple of months and decided now maybe that was maybe it was better after all oh so uh, but in point of fact we, we make these kinds of changes. Uh, we try to save them up and then we give them a new point number or some other uh, mm, uh, designation mm. that's a little different. But a real similar sort of sound. And we, when we have a house sound, as you, as you, might, as you might say. Um, but we continue to offer, for as long as people want them, the, the older product. As I say, uh, I, have, I have in one country a customer base where the distributor has decided that this kind of dealer handles 0.5s and this kind of dealer handles 0.8s, huh. and he orders both. Interesting. I'm perfectly happy building either, whatever people want. It's just fine. Nice. So the next question, which I guess sort of relates to this question, this is from a friend of mine, Dave McNair, who's a recording engineer, recording, mixing, and mastering engineer. And he said, so which measurement uh, is, do you use to rely on to, how could, how could he put it, basically, best indication of you're going in the right direction 
for making it sound better. In other words, which one predicts sound quality best and which measurement predu predicts it the least? Huh. That's very tough. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really, I can't pinpoint any single kind of thing. Okay. It, it's, a, it, it's a suite of measurements that we use to kind of give us our indicators. We, we drive low impedance loads, we drive high impedance loads. Mm -hmm. we, um, we screw around with this stuff a lot in development. And we, but the, and we, and we, and we, the process is really one of you know, uh, listening, measurement, listening, measurement, tweaking things and fooling around. Also, we, you know, we, we try to engage a number of people uh, in, in the process in terms of the subjective response on this. One thing we do is, uh, besides living with product for, for periods of time, is uh, the, the, the people who are involved inside the company all run as, as consistently the same equipment in that mm -hmm. process. So, for example, we all have the tannoys. Mm -hmm. Which tannoys? Uh, these are the 15-inch uh, HPD coaxials from the 60s. Hmm. And they are mounted up in upside-down Jensen Imperials. <laughs> <laughs> I think you took a photo of them, so you'd be able to show that. And uh, with a crossover that Joe Samet had worked on for about 10 years. And Joe was very explicit. Uh, he would say, these aren't the best speakers in terms of just listening for pleasure, but they are the best speakers for evaluating amplifiers. Huh. And I, I had to, we, we had to trust him. He had the best ears of all of us. Unfortunately, he's, he's no longer with us, but we still benefit uh, from from his experiences and, and mm -hmm. the things that he had taught us about listening and and working it and and he had he had the kind of ears that you could perform blind testing with and he gave you very accurate results you know something on the order of maybe ninety percent that's awesome you know being able to spot what's good or bad about something next question comes from David Ellington and he, this is a, this is also might be a tough one to answer. Is uh, what's your favorite amp of the of meaning of the ones you design? Well, I always have the answer, which is oh, that's the good. next one. The next one. Oh. <laughs> I love them all. I mean, they all have they're they're all different. And they all have something about them. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the first watt in particular is a lot of fun for me because I can do anything I want without commercial consideration, mm -hmm. and so. And they are all experiments. They all they all bring something different to the table. So there isn't can. really a first watt sound, though. like there is for the past labs. Uh, much design. less so. There, there, it's, you know, obviously, I, I I try to make them in a manner that I I like the sound, and I presume that you know some small percentage of the buying but, public will also. But you're reticent in terms of saying that a such and such a first watt amplifier is best suited for use with a certain kind of speaker or a certain specific In some cases, there, there, there are examples where a particular speaker is just really happy with uh, any particular model of the first watt. If you're looking at the most pleasingly general amplifier that first watt's done, it would be the J2. Yeah, I knew and, you were going to say that. And, well, and the, and the first watts, I'd always intended to, like, I'll make a hundred, and then it's done. Uh -huh. And uh, that was generally the case uh, until I hit the J2, and here it is, the years go by, and we're still making them because, the, because the, our, our distribution continues to demand it. And, and it's a nice amplifier, mm. you know, but, but it is the one that doesn't defend anybody, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we can't uh, just say that's your favorite? I don't know if I was, you know. If you put a gun if, to your head. If, I, if, we, if we were just talking about first watts, uh -huh. and we're just talking about how much money did you make on this, <laughs> then I would okay. say the sit one, two, and three are by far my favorites. Uh, after that, I would say probably the, the J2, though, is the one that uh, keeps the most people, you know, it, it, people all the time email me, what amplifier do I need? I've got, and you can fill in the blank. But unless mm -hmm. they have something really odd or special, I go, well, you know, the amplifier that you probably will enjoy, and which is a safe bet, and which, you know, and has resale value, would be a J2. Okay. There's nothing about it to offend anybody. Huh. Well, and it's very go. smooth, and sounds really good. I agree. Every time I go back to it, I say, Oh, oh yeah, that it's was like good. putting on comfortable jeans or something. Right? <laughs> it's, it's literally you just 
you relax when you hear it. And I can, very, I, I'm an antsy guy, you know, I'm it, very it's, critical. It was a, uh, yeah, it was, it, and there's nothing wild about it, but it does use really great parts you know, uh -huh. in a really simple single-ended piece. Yeah, you, you do, but that's true for all the first Watts, that because there's fewer parts, you're really fussier about each part and how it affects Oh, very the, fussy the, about parts. I already took you on the tour of yeah, parts. Yeah, right, right, right. And uh, that's an area where I think it's kind of neglected because, uh, you know, people focus on topologies and they, and they, um, they, 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 they focus on, you know, how much feedback is going on or how much power or current. The the thing about parts is is that a considerable portion of the quality that can go into a simple little design like first watt stuff mm -hmm. is very dependent on the parts. And in the case of a J2, for example, you're running those Toshiba unobtainium J FETs along with the Semi South unobtainium J FETs. You you can't even duplicate that amplifier in, in, in the in the marketplace at this point. Wow. I think we've done it. I thought I had okay. more, but I'm looking and I don't see any more. So, uh, Thank you very our work much. here is done. <laughs> yeah. I like this. I, I should do this more often when I'm going to do an interview is have people give me questions. Sure. So uh, thank you. My guest today is, you guys already know, Nelson Pass in his home in C... Uh-oh, now I'm freaking flipping out here. Sea Ranch. Sea Ranch, sorry. Sea Ranch, California. Uh, thanks for watching. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. See you again real soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>